It's time to bring on my panel of leaders who understand both science and the importance of forward-looking policymaking. Phyllis Arthur is Vice President of Infectious Diseases and Diagnostics Policy at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. I go by the short form, BIO. Holden Thorpe is Editor-in-Chief of the Science Family of Journals and a regular interview subject of mine over many years. Dr. Von Tureking is Executive Director of Policy and Global Affairs at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I can talk to him for hours, and we won't get that to do that today, but he's great. And Benjamin Korb, you see him everywhere lately, is Director of Public Affairs at the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Bio Biology. I don't know if you all have seen the last three interviews I've done, but it's been an incredible day for me. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in Washington to talk to such smart people on science. And now I have the four of you. And, and, and let me just start out with you, Holden. I want to convey to the public that what science is. I mean, you've been uh, in this field for so long, and, and I don't want to uh, plant ideas, but I think a lot of folks look at science as a quick shot, as a transaction, as something. But I'd, I'd love to get a sense of the messiness of it, if you will, from you. Well, that's a great uh, question, Steve, and very important right now, because I think a lot of people are really struggling to understand that science is a living process carried out by human beings. And so sometimes we think one thing is correct, and we do experiments, and when those experiments show something else is correct, then we change it. And that's part of the logical way things are uh, that, that things play out. And unfortunately, right now, the uh, oscillations in those, that process are being exploited by a lot of people who want to cast doubt on science. And we need people to understand that science is a living, breathing process carried out by human beings. Uh, Vaughn, I, 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 you know, I sort of feel, and you know, I don't feel this strongly, so I may walk this back for a moment, but uh, let me just tell you what's on my mind. I feel like from everything I've heard today, from reading Susan Hockfield's book, I'm an addict for Phyllis Arthur's organization. They have a great uh, uh, email each day called Good Day Bio. And, and that we have so many technological leaps that are happening today all around us. And yet, I sort of feel like Galileo would be found guilty again today. Can you talk to us a little bit about the tension between advancement and how to get the politics of what all of you are doing right? Yeah, Steve, thank you so much. And it's great to see you again and to be part of this panel. I, I think that one of the things you're speaking to is actually a real challenge that happens at the science and policy interface. And what that is, is that oftentimes science may not be convenient to what people are trying to achieve politically. The time scales are different, the objectives may be different, and in some ways, the, the nature of the questions that are being asked require a nuance or a subtlety or tremendous amounts of certainties that are very difficult to bring into the policymaking process. So I think one of the things that we are seeing, and then I think COVID and, and a number of other things are, are exposing this, is that the, as the colleague, Dr. Holden Thorpe, that the process of science, who does science and how it's done, is actually done by people who have to actually provide ways to iterate on the answer. It's a process as much as an outcome. And oftentimes that can be inconsistent with where publics are, who need to either know definitively that there's an answer, or get frustrated when they hear that that answer is maybe changing, not maybe understanding that that change is part of the process itself. Well, thank you. I think that's, that's very important. Phyllis, uh, let me jump to my friend Phyllis at Bio for a minute, because um, part of what uh, Vaughn and I think Holden were just getting at is the public is out there. Science is moving American society, global society forward. But yet there seems to be a trust deficit. There seems to be enough wiggle room out there that people can get away with doubting science. And I'm interested in why that is. From your perspective, what's missing in enhancing the stock of trust in scientific advancement and scientific authority? Oh, that's a great question. And, and so fun that I would get that question. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, I think that actually one of the issues we're suffering from, I think, is, a, is a, an ability to explain to people in right messenger. So we've been spending a lot of time on this at Bio. Um, science has moved so quickly and progressed so much, as the last two speakers said. 
how do we explain it to everyone in relatively simple terms, not dumb terms, but simpler terms, and, and show what we're learning about the iterations and, what, and honestly say what we do and don't know, um, but put that into the mouths of messengers who can explain why it's relevant to our everyday lives. I mean, our view at Bio is that science is actually one of the most powerful ways to get to social just justice to solve really serious macro issues. But how do we help people understand that in order to do that, there's going to be some iterations and some missteps. I think it's about having a, a host of different kinds of people talking about the power of science as opposed to just the same people talking about the power of science. Well, do you think, um, Phyllis, that that is getting better? Do you think, whether it's clinical trials, whether it is you know, looking at what's, what's going to come down the pike on the coronavirus vaccine, when it's looking at some of the things that I've talked to um, uh, uh, Susan Hockfield, talk, you know, talk to others about, do you think that we're beginning, you know, I, I mean, just put a word to me. I mean, if you go down this, the road to Johns Hopkins University, and I love Johns Hopkins, they themselves said, we don't have enough people of color in our ranks to basically create that. So is that in the ranks problem in the way of getting addressed in any serious way? So I think that's one of the most important things we really have to work on. If anything, this pandemic has shown us the disparities in, underst in understanding of the various scientific issues. So um, we've been working on things like that through this whole bioequality work that we're rolling out at Bio. But you look at other organizations like the National Black Churches Initiative or others who've been trying to educate communities of color about the importance of scientific right. endeavors like clinical trials and why we all need to participate in scientific exploration, whether it's our kids or being in trials on diseases that matter to our community. Um, we all need to do better at understanding our role in participating in the scientific um, exercise so that we can get to answers that actually serve all of us. And so the bioequality forum, uh, bioequality activities we're working on at Bio are about not just educating more, but bringing more science to more people and increasing the number of messages and messengers. Well, well thank you. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Benjamin a question, but I think this is equally relevant to Holden and, and to Vaughn. Vaughn uh, 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 started a journal years ago called Science and Diplomacy uh, that I had the honor, the privilege of being involved with. Um, but when you kind of look at the question, I'm going to ask Ben. And uh, Ben, please don't take offense about what I'm going to say. But uh, Ben, and D the word diva is very good in my world. So, but Ben is the diva of the moment, the most flamboyant guy saying, wait, science has a process. Science has rules. There are no shortcuts you know, in, in genuine science. So Ben, I wanna, I wanna ask you and invite you to share with you your concerns right now about the manipulation of the environment that science is being forced to play in. Because I've, I've been impressed with what you've shared, but share it with our public. And, and I do look at you as the diva of this, and it's a good thing. <laughs> well, today is a historic day where I've never been referred to as a diva before, so thank you for that. Um, my biggest concern as we look at what's happening today, particularly in the pandemic that we're dealing with, is Science and the virus don't particularly care about the news cycle, the need for there to be a 24-hour update to things or a constant update during that 24 hours. Science and the virus doesn't care about the election cycle and when election day is or when a primary is or whether it needs to have an October surprise to make the, the election more exciting. Um, the process is going to be what the process is. And we all want... Um, we want a vaccine for this virus quickly. We want treatments for this virus quickly. We want to understand how this virus operates, and we want to understand that now. You know, I want my kids to be in school, not around the corner from my office here, trying to figure their way through 17 Zooms throughout the day. Right. Um, I like working in my home office, but I'd rather be in my office, and I'm sure my wife would as well. Um, we're only going to know it when we go through the process, like like Vaughn and like Holden had mentioned, there's a process and you know scientists don't get to say i feel like this is going to be the thing that'll work um in the same way that perhaps the president and, and, says, and, and not to interrupt but i'm going to interrupt you ben i'm going to interrupt you for a minute when sure. when stephen hahn of the fda said hey you know these preliminary re results look back you zapped him you zapped him and said you know you're not supposed to be about how you feel so i just want to give credit where credit's due 
Sure, then I'll, I'll, yeah, we, scientists don't get to say how they feel about these things. They get to say what the data shows. Um, and, and, you know, the data preliminarily shows that, uh, you know, plasma therapy may work, but the data doesn't prove it. We don't have the evidence yet. And so to go in front on a podium and tell, you know, you know, 300 million Americans, this is the thing that's going to work is not only is it inaccurate and irresponsible, but it's not scientific and we need to ensure that the science is trusted across the board. And so when the president says take hydroxychloroquine because you know I found a study that shows that it works and then we find out that it doesn't work, the public is confused and doesn't know who to trust or who's saying the right thing or where to go. And we simply can't have that in a public health emergency like what we're dealing with today. Welcome to my world on cholesterol. Mm -hmm. I don't know if eggs are bad. They keep changing. Are they good? Are they bad? You know, that's another subject. But let me let me go back to my friend Holden because Holden, you, you science, uh, uh, the the magazine Science, of which you are editor in chief, is is that a peer reviewed publication? Absolutely, yes. So it is uh, peer reviewed. So, part, so yeah. I don't think the terms peer reviewed have had more financial or economic consequence in my lifetime or memory. But, you know, when you look at the vaccine makers and others and having to do peer reviewed things and the frustration with the amount of time that things take, let me just put it point blank to you and challenge, um, you know, when, when uh, uh, Anthony Fauci uh, was being chased and beaten up by Larry Kramer during the HIV AIDS era saying, make it faster, do more, move quicker, live people are dying. Are there things that are practices or habits in your world that could be made better or faster or leaner in times of security and, and not sacrifice science? Or as is, is what you're doing now as good as it gets? Uh, well, it's very important that scientists publish things in peer reviewed journals like ours and, and others. Uh, one advance we've had since uh, Tony Fauci was doing things on HIV is now we have something called preprints where researchers can put their uh, what looks like a paper to a lot of people on a, a server. Uh, that paper hasn't been reviewed yet, so we refer to it as a preprint. And that has a very good effect because that allows other experts to uh, see the data while we're doing our peer review process. Now, it has a downside, which we've seen uh, quite clearly the last few months, and that is that people can uh, take the preprint and use it to either sow confusion, which I think is the primary goal of the Trump administration, as Ben was just saying around all this, or to make claims that haven't really been completely scrutinized. But in normal times, preprints do a, a really good thing, which is they allow other researchers to see data while we are in the process of doing our peer review. And in the case of, of COVID, all of the big uh, publishers agreed that we would encourage all of COVID papers uh, to be placed on preprint servers while we were doing our review. So we have a pretty good right. system uh, worked out for that. It's just uh, susceptible to political manipulation, which unfortunately all four of your panelists here are, are spending a lot of time dealing with. Well, hold on. And also, I, I'd love to get your insights, and I want to jump to Vaughn, but in, in, uh, of what Phyllis shared, that, that, the, that the array of talent that we have out there is, 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 is not as, as diverse as it could be or should be, that there are blind spots because of that. Um, and you know, you've been head of a couple of universities. You've been in the science field for a long time. You know, when you hear Phyllis, you know, talk about that, and organizations like Bio saying they're going to try to do their part to bring more people into that arena, not only as trusted voices but as personnel, you're you're in a place that's at the nexus of science. From your perch, what can the Bios of the world do, or the associations do, or universities do that they're not? to create a more diverse uh, set of stakeholders in science? Well, I think all the en entities you mentioned are at different points along this pathway of, of recognizing uh, and addressing these problems. I think universities in some ways have been doing it a little longer than, for example, institutions like ours. But just like anything, the first step is for everyone to acknowledge that we have a problem with uh, sexism and systemic racism in science, uh, not to be afraid 
of acknowledging that uh, so that we can get the problems out in the open, not spend a whole lot of time arguing about what happened in the past. Instead, just transparently acknowledge that there's been problems and that will lead us to a place where we can start making some changes. But there's no question that if you look at uh, the, the, the authors on our papers, uh, where those papers come from, what kinds of institutions they come from. There are all kinds of inequities throughout the system that are revealed by very simple analysis of, uh, of who's participating in science. And as, as Phyllis said, uh, that leads to a lot of deficiencies, not just for the product, the scientific product, but also just fairness in the world. So, you know, sometimes you hear people say, uh, equity and diversity make science better. Certainly that's true, but equity and diversity are good things on their own, not just because they make science better. We need to have the courage right. to talk about that in a, a very straightforward way. Well, let's do a deal right here. Phyllis, you there still? Um, why don't I get Phyllis and uh, uh, Holden and a number of us together? Um, and Phyllis's new CEO is Michelle McMurray Heath, an outstanding uh, first African-American female to head bio. So let's get another program together with all of us and we can talk about this. Is that a deal, Phyllis? That would be fantastic. I know Michelle would love it. And I think that we are trying to better understand how to message and, and leverage messengers in this space and also stimulate more investment in different populations becoming scientists joining companies coming to industry to participate in the science as well as academia. I know that myself and I'm sure Dr. McMurray would love to discuss it. Um, I've got a question for Vaughn, but before I, because we don't have enough time to get to everything I want to, but I want to mention that Phyllis's organization has been supportive of another uh, effort that's so close to what Benjamin Corb is doing called Stronger, which looks at the various dimensions of how science operates and how important scientific method and process falsifiability and all of those dimensions are. Uh, so I wanted to kind of show those links there as well. Vaughn, I'm going to give you the last tough question and the last word. You uh, were a genius of science and diplomacy. And I want to tell my audience that you were in part, your organization then at AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, was responsible for getting the first science advisor to the Secretary of State. And then taking science and using it as this way to cut through some of the most hostile rogue governments in the world because the and, and, and to create linkages with them that were apolitical, but to find ways in which science could move things forward with a North Korea, a Cuba, other problematic nations in the world. So I want to ask you, what can be done to do that between Republicans and Democrats today? <laughs> oh, science, science diplomacy may have its limits. Um, but I think one of the things, it gets back to maybe the first question, is to focus on, on the fact that science can help inform shared problems. The, mm. the problem with coronavirus, despite what you, you may sometimes hear, is actually a problem that doesn't have a, a political bound. It doesn't need to have a geographical bound. It's something where shared knowledge, shared action, shared advice is actually good for everybody, no matter what your political right. leanings or non-leanings. And that's a critical piece. And, and I will say, you know, sometimes you in, in diplomacy, and I, and I had the, the pleasure to serve as the as the fifth science advisor to the to the Secretary of State. And, and we think in terms of diplomacy and, and often speak to the fact that where trust is broken, process is critical. Right. And science is as much an outcome as it is a process it's, it's diplomacy in many ways I, I do want to add to, to, to my colleagues on the on the line about the, the earlier conversation you're having I think this is going to be another area which is it's just critical for the scientific community to take a much deeper look at itself right and and to ask the hard questions you know we launched a year and a half ago at the National Academy of Sciences, a roundtable on black men and black women in science, engineering, and medicine, which brings together some of the top scientists and engineers and medical professionals around, right. the, around the country to deal with many of these issues. And those also require a very strong science and diplomacy connection.
Right. Well, I want to thank all of you. This is a fantastic conversation. We can make a full co a conference out of the four of you. Uh, but thank you to Phyllis Arthur of Bio, Holden Thorpe, Editor-in-Chief of the Science Family of Journals, Von Tarekian of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and Benjamin Korb of the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. It's an honor. Thank you for going uh, uh, and, and having a four-way conversation with me today on such an important topic. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.